Musketry, delivered by troops armed with a P-53, would have scarcely looked any different than that delivered by troops from earlier generations armed with the percussion smoothbore muskets of the 1840s and earlier the flintlock arms of the Napoleonic era. Companies and battalions delivering their fire while standing in line were a feature of training and of warfare of the age. What the P-53 gave British and Empire infantry over previous weapons was range and accuracy. Instead of the paltry 100 yards afforded by the Brown Bess, the Enfield could engage an enemy at 600 yards with effect, and it was this aspect of the muzzle-loading rifled arm that would begin to change the way warfare was practiced. Skirmishing or fighting in extended order to cover movement or to prevent an enemy from conducting reconnaissance took on a more important role. This was also important in areas where close country or ground that was unsuitable for open mass deployments was found. Indeed, the practice of it became universal rather than being the preserve of certain units or companies within battalions. That said, musketry was still practiced in one of three ways. By a formed body of troops with either volleys or file firing, or when that same body was extended with files firing independently of one another. The drills for these practices were laid down in the manuals of the era. Typical of these is the one used as a reference for this video, the Field Exercise and Evolutions of Infantry of 1859. According to this, fire was typically delivered by unit rather than by rank. Although the whole battalion could give its fire all at once, fire was typically delivered by subunit, the company, or wing. Although smaller subunits such as the half company, also known as the subdivision, or even section, could theoretically be used. This ensured that, most importantly, control could be maintained, and that fire would be delivered in a rolling sequence down the line with companies giving their fire while others were waiting or loading. Perhaps the classic example of volley firing in the era of the muzzle-loading rifle was the 93rd's action at Balaclava, where volley fire commenced at some 600 yards. Their target, of course, was Russian cavalry. The 93rd's volleys caused the Russians to veer and abandon their advance on the town of Balaclava. Now, of course, the 93rd weren't armed with the P-53 Enfield rifle musket, but rather a similar weapon of an earlier generation. This was known as the P-51 Minier rifle. Although of larger caliber, it was generally as effective. As alluded to in a previous video on the platoon exercise, the command to actually fire was the word present, whereby the man raised his weapon, aimed, and fired, generally together, but theoretically on his own time when satisfied his aiming was correct. Given that, a volley fired by a company or a section would have looked something like this. Company will fire a volley! At 300 yards! Ready! As you saw, on the cautionary, the rear rank closed up 9 inches to the front. In order for both ranks to present their rifles to the front at the same time, on the word of command ready, the front rank modified its ready position slightly by moving the left foot forward and to the left. Present! As prescribed in the manual, each man took his own aim and squeezed the trigger when his target was covered. Following the discharge of their piece, every man, unless specifically ordered not to, automatically reloaded. Although it was stated in the drill that the number of volleys should be included in the order, it stands to reason that once given the order to commence volley firing, that fire would continue in that fashion until ordered to stop. Present! For use at closer range, or when defending against cavalry, the technique of file firing was employed. File firing from the right of companies! Commence firing! As prescribed in the manual, the file on the named flank presented. Then, the front rank man delivered his fire, followed by his rear rank man. 
In this fashion, fire continued down the frontage of the named unit. It's interesting to note that rather than recommencing fire from the named flank and repeating the process, once a given file had delivered its fire in sequence, it was then to reload and fire without any regard to neighboring files. In effect, this then became independent fire. In this fashion, the named subunit continued firing until the word of command cease firing. As mentioned earlier in the video, fighting in extended order became more important as the range and accuracy of the rifled musket began to tell on the battlefield. This was invariably done from the kneeling position, and therefore loading and firing in that position was of utmost importance. As demonstrated in this photograph, the files remained together with the front and the rear rank man close to one another and positioned as they were in close order, the only difference being the number of paces between files. Each rank had its own peculiar way to load. These techniques minimized the interference of the rifle with the other man in the file. Shown here on the left, the front rank man moved his weapon to his left side under his arm and pointing to the front, while the rear rank man threw the rifle butt forward, angling the muzzle to the rear and loading from that position. In this photograph from the 1860s, we see files extended fighting a mock battle. The front rank man is presenting his piece, while the rear rank man is in the act of loading Note the position of his rifle pointed to the rear. Of course, fighting in this fashion was done as part of a bigger picture. Units tasked with fighting in extended order typically broke down into three different lines, as this diagram of a battalion extended to skirmish shows. The firing line, consisting of files extended at a given number of paces, and typically consisting of between one quarter and one third of the given unit. The second line were known as the supports, and typically consisted between a quarter and a third of the unit, held behind the firing line and ready to reinforce it should that be required. The supports were typically not extended and kept in a closer formation for ease of movement. At the rear, and typically consisting of between a third and a half of the given unit, was the reserve. It would commonly use closer formations, such as close or quarter column. It could be used to cover a retreat cover a flank, or reinforce successful action on the battlefield. Here in this photograph, we have an example of a battalion deployed in this three-tiered formation. At the bottom of the photograph, we can see the firing line with its files extended in the kneeling position. Behind them are two companies of supports, also in the kneeling position, ready to come forward and reinforce the firing line if required. In the rear, standing in close column, is the reserve. Also there is the band who would act as stretcher bearers in action. Fighting in this type of environment demanded that the men use all available cover and a higher degree of initiative was required of the individual soldier to select that cover as well as to set his sights accordingly for effective engagement of the enemy. During this type of engagement the file would typically use a technique whereby one man fired and reloaded covered by his file mate. Here we have an example of a file who has just finished extending. After halting, they adopt the kneeling position and then are given the word of command to load. LOAD! Note the two distinctive loading positions for the front and the rear ranks. As illustrated in the manual, the front rank man moves his weapon to the left side under the armpit. The butt was placed over the right foot. The rear rank man, while not changing his feet and knee positions, threw the butt of the rifle forward so that the barrel pointed to the rear. Once loaded, they would be given a range and the word of command ready. At 300 yards! Ready! The general order to open fire would be given by the bugle. Once that order had been relayed, the company commander and his officers and NCOs would then give the word of command, commence firing. Firing! 
Note how the front rank man, on the word of command commenced firing, presented and gave his fire while covered with the loaded weapon of the rear rank man. When the front rank man had finished loading and capping, he would then give the word of command ready. This would be the signal for the rear rank man to present and give his fire. It's important to note here that the rear rank man should be closed up a little farther forward than is shown. This is due to, shall we say, my technical limitations. Ready. And so the pattern would continue for either the number of rounds specified or until the word of command cease firing was given. This basic technique could also be used on the move while the skirmish line advanced or retired in the face of stronger opposition. In these instances, the man with the loaded weapon would always assume a position in front of the man who was loading. This particular file, although static and in open ground, would typically have found any nearby cover in which to load and fire from. Once the word of command to cease fire was given, it was each man's responsibility to complete the loading of his weapon. The skirmish line could then be ordered forward or to the rear, depending on the circumstances. Like most orders given to troops in extended order, orders to move would be given on the bugle. By modern standards, these methods of the application of musketry seem rather simple. They were, however, governed by the inherent aspects of the muzzle-loading rifle, its rate of fire, and the fact that they were still more efficiently loaded from the standing position. By the late 1860s, however, the advent of breech-loading would soon transform tactics and formations on the battlefield. I thought I'd take this opportunity to give a little historical background to the kit worn in this video. Any amount of cursory internet research of the 78th Highlanders during the Indian Mutiny would have you quickly arrive at images such as these. These paintings show the 78th Highlanders in what amounts to home service full dress, with the one concession being a white cover on their Kilmarnock bonnets. Some artwork even shows them in their full dress feather bonnets. Other artwork shows them in a perhaps more subdued shirt sleeve order, though still kilted. The reality was that the only vestige left of their Highland uniform was in fact their Kilmarnock bonnet, and even these may have been replaced later in the campaign by a hodgepodge of locally made headdress, including wicker helmets. Artwork is scarce, and photographs non-existent, so with permission I've used these images of some wargaming miniatures that best serve to illustrate the reality. The 78th in fact campaigned in the Indian Mutiny during the relief of Lucknow, in a uniform that was best described as nondescript. They probably wore their issue shirt sleeves with locally made dungarees or trousers. Their Kilmonic bonnets had a curtained cover and were swathed in various degrees of cloth, forming a turban-like appearance. As for their weaponry, only about a quarter were armed with the Enfield rifle musket, the remainder having to make do with the older smoothbore P-42. Khaki, Karki, or Drab, as it was also known, was in its embryonic state during the Indian Mutiny. Many operations were conducted at the height of the hot season, and the wearing of shirt sleeves and various forms of hurriedly dyed undress uniforms was done out of necessity and the want for something more appropriate. The dress worn by the 78th Highlanders during this period in the Mutiny forms the inspiration for the kit worn in this video. For those of you who may be interested, the images of the 78th Highlander military miniatures seen in the video are a product of Iron Duke miniatures. This is the company belonging to Colonel Mike Snook, who is a renowned author and an expert in Victorian military history. His website is chock full of marvelous historical detail, painstakingly researched and presented in an easy-to-read format. 
As mentioned, he's an accomplished author, penning books on the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879 and the Sudan campaigns of the 1880s. These titles, along with others he's penned, form a must-have addition to any military library. As always, thanks for watching.